Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Sheena Mason and this is Free Your Mind. I want to talk with you today about philosophies of race and more specifically the philosophies of race that undergird my theory of racelessness. Now, I've spoken pretty extensively about philosophies of race across all of the podcasts that I've done here on my channel, as well as in virtually every other podcast that appearance or radio appearance I've made elsewhere. But I thought it would be prudent to come and do something specifically solo um, on the philosophies of race and especially explaining more my own philosophies of race. Now, my first book, my forthcoming book that comes out with Palgrave at the end of June, delves very deeply into philosophies of race and gives a history of African-American philosophies of race across time that I think are essential to understanding how I come to develop the philosophy of race that I now hold. Um, but what's the harm in also sharing and just having a conversation with y'all? These are the philosophies of race. This is how I think about it. And here's a little bit about how I got here myself. So within the field of philosophy, there's a specialization called philosophy of race. And philosophers, even if they have different names for the same philosophies, um, they have come to categorize how people think about what race is and how people think about what should be done with race in similar, if not the same ways with some variations in terms of the name that's being used to describe said philosophy of race. And every single one of us holds two philosophies of race, even without having any knowledge or insight into this specialization within the discipline of philosophy. And one philosophy speaks to what a person thinks race is, one philosophy speaks to what a person thinks should be done with race. A common error that I see a lot of people falling into is they, they get hung up on what's called skepticism, as I am a racial skeptic, and they miss the point that I think is ultimately more important, which is my eliminativism. And a lot of constructionists, also tend to fall into the trap of hyper-focusing and trying to disprove my skepticism or tell me why I'm wrong for being a racial skeptic, which is an error for a lot of reasons, including but not limited to, to the fact that I've studied race and racism for well over a decade, as well as I've experienced race and racism for virtually my entire life. And so to say the least, I know what my positions are and I'm very comfortable and confident in those positions. However, I can't empathize with people who approach my skepticism from that mindset because I've gone through the journey of philosophies myself. Um, and it was a long and arduous path to, path to get to where I am. So the six philosophies of race include something called naturalism. Naturalists argue that race is biological, that it's something that persons are born with. It's in our DNA, it's in our ancestry, it's something inherited, all of those things. And biological features such as skin complexion, hair texture, the bridges of our noses, the fullness of our lips and the fullness of our hips, et cetera, are all markers of this thing called race. Then there's a category called constructionism. Constructionists argue that race isn't necessarily biological, but based on some biological features such as DNA and ancestry, how a person looks, et cetera, there are there's a socially constructed reality to what's called race and this constructionist position is probably the most dominant position in today's society at least as it pertains to the united states 
where people say things to the effect of race isn't real. It was completely made up to oppress and subjugate certain groups of people. Uh, But what those people really mean is race is not real in nature. However, it manifests itself in real ways, which makes it real. And it's that realness, it's that difference, which seems very slight if you're not astute to it, but it is that difference in how a person conceives of race that makes the the third category of skepticism that much more challenging intellectually and emotionally, spiritually, all of the things for people to really grapple meaningfully with. Skeptics argue that race is not real biologically nor is it real as a social construction. And for most skeptics, Anthony Appiah being one of the most renowned skeptical eliminativists, the fact that society organizes itself around its belief in race and practices racialization, which is the active ways in which we look at ourselves and we look at each other and we say, you're black, you're white, you're Asian, you're fill in the blank, you're biracial, you're multiracial, all of the above. It is that act of applying race onto other people that skeptics such as Appiah and myself recognize. Um, and yet that doesn't make the phenomena any more real. So when a skeptic such as myself says race is not real, we mean it. <laughs> I mean sincerely that race is not real. And for those of you who would find that to be a provocative statement, I'm going to dig in further after I get to the other side of listing the remaining three philosophies. So the last three philosophies of race speak to what a person thinks should be done with race. The first category is something called conservationism. Conservationist argue that the concept of race should be kept, it should be maintained, it should be conserved. Now, these people are usually naturalists because after all, what can you do with nature except keep it? Um, Makes sense, right? (laughs) The next category is something called reconstructionism. Reconstructionists contend that the concept of race is malleable, it's fluid, it's not fixed, it's something that transforms and transmutes and can be changed further to enact or exact less violence onto different groups of people. Now, reconstructionists are also, in a lot of ways, conservationists in that they want to maintain or keep the concept of race Uh, However, there is a sort of refashioning that they would require or work toward, whereas conservationists who are naturalists aren't trying to reconstruct anything, right? It, It is what it is if it's in nature. And then the last category that speaks to what a person thinks should be done with race is something called eliminativism. Eliminativists argue that the concept of race Uh, should be done away with. It should be thrown into the dustbins of forgotten history. And most eliminativists are skeptics, but constructionists are also skeptics as well. In fact, before I came to my current skeptical eliminativist position on race, I was a constructionist eliminativist. And before that, I was a constructionist reconstructionist and so on. And my mentor from Howard University, the chair of the philosophy department, is currently a constructionist eliminativist. So it is possible to hold that race is real in a socially constructed sense, while also recognizing that the realness of race and the practice of racialization is what actually manifests its attending racism. So to undo racism, one must undo the concept of race, whether you believe it's socially constructed or whether you believe that it doesn't exist at all, period. Uh, It is very possible to conclude, to come to the same conclusion that it should be eliminated. 
And I can share a link to a Journal of Free Black Thought publication that Jacoby Carter from Howard University and myself co-wrote where we talk about and illuminate the differences between my skepticism and his constructionism. And then we carve out some space for our shared eliminativism to really illustrate the ways in which we can come at the, the, the concept of race from a different perspective, and yet we still come to the same conclusions and why and all of that. So I'll share a link to that in the description box and I'm making myself a note so I remember <laughs> to follow through on that promise. So my philosophies of race, I'm a skeptical eliminativist and my skepticism takes me actually a lot further than most people's racial skepticism would. And that difference um, matters in some ways because in some ways my skepticism is forging a new path forward or a more viable path toward eliminativism forward. Here's how and here's why. So most racial skeptics would say that racial identity or the practice of racialization Anything that a person can look at and say, this is socially constructed, most racial skeptics don't believe that social constructions are real. Just by, by nature, the fact that they don't exist in nature, that they're not biological. And so in that same way, we could talk about money not being real. We could talk about nation. We could talk about state states. You know, there's not an actual border written on the land anywhere. Um that ethnicity is socially constructed. Some people would say gender is socially constructed. There's a way in which racial skeptics would also be skeptical about all of those other socially constructed categories. However, that's not where my skepticism um, is. It's, it's not how it operates. For me, the unrealness of race as it pertains to the context of the U.S. especially is, is rooted in the fact that race doesn't exist in nature. I believe the modern scientists and geneticists who have disproven this idea that there are biological human races, plural, right? And I believe that there is one human race. So in that way, I agree with those folks in the literature that exists that disproves the existence of race as being something of nature. And for me, the social constructionism part and the reason why the second tenet or the second rule of my theory of racelessness asserts that race doesn't exist as a social construction is because every time I see race or something that's perceived to be racial um, in literature, in discourse, in media, in, in art, in anything, I can translate that racial language. And here I'm talking about the words that uh, many Americans tend to associate with race, like white and black, namely, and first and foremost. I can look at that language and I can translate it into something else. Oftentimes, and this is what my first book really exposes and explores, oftentimes that language is, is pointing to racism that's happening, either racism in practice or the effects of racism. And that's why the race of um, certain people or characters you name it as being explicated. So in those moments, this, this racelessness translation, one of the tools I put forth in the book, helps me to translate instances of, or examples or the effects of racism that sometimes race language is actually doing the work of. And it's my argument that the reason why we continue to have or or be in this quagmire of continued racism is largely upheld by the misdirection of our discourse and policies as it pertains to this idea in the belief in race itself. We constantly talk about racism, the problem of racism in the language of race, 
which for too many generations has rooted people into the language of race and viewing themselves as being and having an identity that is racial, which is then really hard and difficult and arduous to help people disconnect themselves from, even though that connection is largely negative, it has largely detrimental and negative impacts not just on oneself, but on the nation or at, at in the global um, sphere as well. And when race cannot be translated into racism itself, then it can be translated into something cultural that's being signal signaled, or it can translate into something ethnic that's being signaled. And a mistake a lot of people in the States make is they hear ethnic or they hear ethnicity and they still think race in their heads, right? They still think white, black, Asian, et cetera. And that for me is, is also il illustrative of the work that needs to be done if we are serious about forging a more positive and fruitful path forward together that for more people to thrive because ethnicity is not the same thing as what people would say race is. And the sooner we can get our hands around the differences, right, the sooner we can do that, then the sooner we can disentangle ourselves from racism, which is also hiding its face in the concept of race along with ethnicity. And the same goes for culture. Too many people, when they see uh, race language, they conflate it with culture. And that's why you have most publications nowadays, if especially if they're left leaning, will have the capital B for the word black, right? It's this idea that across time, what it is to be racialized as black has led to the production of a particular culture and to recognize and honor both race and culture that's at play with the capital B black, we have to capitalize the thing. And then you have white supremacists coming along and saying, oh, no, 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 me too, me too. And when I say white supremacists, I mean people who sincerely and explicitly argue that racialized white people are superior and um, have a fear of other racialized groups somehow flipping the tables and dominating, right? There are people who fit that bill, who I see very explicitly trying to dismantle and discredit my work and call me the N-word and, and all of the, the um, unimaginative tactics that people will take when they feel that their centers are being threatened, right? So you have these pe people who are literal white supremacists who, because they see the capitalization of the B and Black, and they conflate all of that thing with race as much as people want to say no it's culture no it but the culture it's argued comes from a race right now we're going to capitalize the w in white and then there's this whole debacle <laughs> that i see playing out on, in different sectors of society where if there's a capital b in black then somebody's inevitably commenting and, and and arguing about the white should be capitalized too. Because for those people, there is such a thing as white culture, there is such a thing as white race, and there is such a thing as white supremacy. And so long as we continue to encourage that language, the language that is so clearly rooted in a racialized context, um, in American society, which again is rooted in race and racism that was in response to chattel slavery and attempts to justify that system. So long as we continue to 
move along this this path of we can't have better language that describes the culture that we're pointing to. We can't have language freed from the strictures of racism. We can't have language freed from the history of chattel slavery. We can't have language freed from the strictures that other people outside of us today in 2022 put onto us so long as we continue to dig in our heels and insist that we use the same language to describe something that's cultural, that's rooted in racism, that then unintentionally upholds racism, we continue to, to um, unintentionally, more often than not, uphold the problem of racism. And not just the problem of racism, but the effects of racism. So part of my theories work and part of my efforts in sharing information with as many people as will listen is helping people recognize the difference between ethnicity, culture, which is inevitably part of ethnicity, class, social class and economic class, and racism itself. And if every single time we see race, we can translate it into these other more precise terms, which are also actual social constructions. That is why I contend that race isn't real in nature, nor is it real as a social construction. And I cannot be compelled to actually see this in a different way. The same way that an atheist, just because society believes in um, some sort of higher power, the bulk of society believes in higher power, cannot be compelled to agree in the realness of a God or God's plural. That's how racial skepticism works for me. And I would say it's probably how it works for most people who know what they're talking about. Just because people are people believe in the fiction or the God of race and its existence doesn't mean that I have to contend or agree that this thing is real in any meaningful way. What is real for me that too many people miss because they hear racelessness and they don't understand, they misconstrue. And instead of actually learning with an open mind and an open heart, they tell themselves stories about what's at what's afoot as opposed to actually investigating, uh, which, I mean, not for nothing, that's not a new happening. People do this with all kinds of topics and ideas. Um, so it's not personal, but it is highly unfortunate because it keeps the door closed to those people who are just unwilling to engage in a way that helps them understand even if they still don't agree right people don't have to agree with my skepticism and yet they can still agree with the eliminativism a point too many people miss um but part of part of the hindrance as it pertains to race ideology and believing in the fiction of race as something that's real in the, the first place comes down to the fact that for centuries we've been viewing it as viewing it it being race and the language associated with it we've been viewing it from these limiting philosophies of race because we're not taught actual philosophies of race so we're not taught the alternatives so when they do pop up we misunderstand or we mischaracterize and we try to dismiss it or devalue it as something that's not worthwhile Meanwhile, racism is still hiding its face with all of these other things that have actual benefits, such as culture. It's, it seems obvious to me that culture offers a lot of beneficial, um, both material benefits, but, but also just psychological benefits, you know, um, even spiritual benefits. If we include religion, there's a lot of benefits that come out of culture. And the fact that we continue to racialize culture is limiting us. It's limiting our ability to get outside of this thing called racism and to stop it in its tracks. And it's highly unfortunate uh, because 
there are alternative frameworks such as the theory of racelessness that can help people stop it in its tracks. And as much as that sounds idyllic or utopic or just really optimistic, I literally live the experience of helping people disentangle all of these things on a regular basis on a, in, on a global context. So you, you cannot tell me and look me in my eyes that the work that I'm doing isn't more generative and productive than how we've literally been doing this work against racism for centuries. And part of my evidence for how constructionism doesn't get us to eliminativism, which means it doesn't get us beyond racism, uh, is because of this insistence that race is real in any way and in any meaningful way. And the fact that too many constructionists, they root their belief in race in, in skin color and how a person looks, they root it in nature. So there are naturalist underpinnings to constructionist philosophies of race that then make it virtually impossible for more people to get outside of the thing. And newsflash, a lot of the division that we see persisting today as it pertains to po usually politicized conversations about racism is perpetuated or created by the fact that we cannot we have not opened the door to people to analyze, talk about, teach about, learn about the problem of racism from outside of the strictures of racism. And too many people presume that's impossible or presume it's this thing when it's not that thing. And it's, it's highly unfortunate because my theory is literally a direct confrontation with the problem of racism and its detrimental effects and impacts on human beings. Um, and if it can't, I can't be any more explicit about that. It's like hitting my head against a brick wall in some senses, because even as I'm talking about the problem of racism, people will say and hear what they want including but not limited to this idea that but how how with the theory of racistness how can we actually address racism you mean besides the fact that i'm addressing racism explicitly outright I, I, make it make sense i i don't that doesn't make any sense to me but it makes sense to the naysayers, the people who are trying to tell me what I should think about race and racism, which is hugely ironic um, for many, many, many reasons. And in my last podcast that I did with Amiel um, Handelsman, I pulled up a chart and I started talking about this question of law enforcement. And I was talking about the threat to human society that law enforcement does or does not have. And I was talking about how one of the impacts of racism, which is continuously upheld by the upholding of race ideology, is a misunderstanding of what racism actually is, how it manifests, and how it impacts people. And too many times in, in the public sphere, we have people talking about systemic racism. We have people talking about the material conditions of systemic racism, using all of the lingo, lingo, <laughs> the lingo, <laughs> using all of the lingo. And when you ask them questions, it's so clear to me that many of them, because they're working from within the fishbowl of race ideology and because they refuse to see it any other way, they don't have a clear idea of what the material conditions are. They have still racist ideas about what it is to be a racialized black person in American society or in the world, broadly speaking, they are still ironically and paradoxically upholding the white supremacy. They say that they're trying to dismantle and deconstruct. <laughs> and it makes me laugh 
not because it's actually funny, but because oftentimes there's a saying, you have to laugh to keep from crying. That's me on a pretty consistent basis uh, because again, usually well-intended people have completely missed the entire point, including but not limited to what racism is and how it impacts people. Now, in my forthcoming book, I define racism as including the belief in race as being something in nature or a construction and the practice of racializing people. And again, when I say racializing people, I'm really just talking about the practice of imposing a race onto a human being, a race that is not human, right? Not expressly human onto a human being with the language that I've talked about, right? And the most common idea people have about race and racism is this black and white. What people overlook too often, I think, about racism is how it's internalized. And even saying that racism can be internalized and is internalized, people will hear what they believe usually, which is that, oh, racialized Black people or people who are racialized as being of color, that those people are internalizing beliefs about their superiority or inferiority in a quote unquote white supremacist nation. This is that, that thinking, right? Well, that certainly is one way that racism can be internalized, except in some really paradoxical ways, it makes racialized black people specifically always the victim of something or other in ways that I, I don't think are intentional either. And so the people who are speaking out against the so-called victimization of racialized black people as it pertains to one's ability to overcome racism, speak out about it in this, with this sentiment of, it's not good for so-called black people to view themselves as victims. But in, in, in a weird way, that's also saying that racialized black people are victims of something else. And I would, I would contend that racialized black people, almost all racialized black people that I know have a very high way of thinking of themselves. I don't know very many racialized black people who feel that they are victims and that's it with no nuance, you know, no uh, complex understanding of what that means, right? With a very, it's, it's so strange. I don't have a different word right now. It's so strange to me that there's this narrative of racialized black people are being taught by the quote unquote left to be perpetual victims. And then there's all this talk about um, what that does to self-esteem and so on and so forth. Now, undoubtedly, self-esteem is impacted by racism. Absolutely, it is. But I know countless racialized Black people who think very highly of themselves, who have very healthy self-esteems, and in a lot of ways, think the exact opposite of so-called white supremacy, right? Think that um, that racialized Black people are it <laughs> for a lot of reasons. And the interesting part about that fact for me is the fact that racialized Black people have taken something that was meant to annihilate them, have taken racism and racist ideas about them that was really meant to annihilate them in some ways and annihilate their sense of self and their sense of self-worth in particular. And they have twisted it and flipped it on its head in a way that empowers them. And that should not be devalued or diminished. Where that becomes a problem primarily is the fact that 
when I speak about racialized or internalized racism, I'm really speaking to the fact that many racialized Black people are taught that they don't belong. Um, they don't belong in most places in the world. They don't belong in a country like the United States, that the United States is just out to get them. It's completely racist. Law enforcement are out hunting them. You name it, there's some sort of attending narrative as it pertains to what racism is and what its impacts are. And because there's this passing on of the trauma of racism, that really started in the context of what would become the United States with chattel slavery. Because this is generational passing on of these traumas, there is a sociological and psychological aspect to that inheritance of that same trauma. That on the one hand, you have generations of people making the best of situations that seem to be against them, right? And even thriving under those conditions. On the other hand, you have the psychological aspect and the social and the cultural aspect of what happens when the generational trauma getting passed on in the ways that it does when that trauma when that violence, when that history gets internalized in ways that preclude too many people from seeing more clearly and with more clear eyes about the problem of racism. And because there's nothing positive about being racialized and because racialized white people are also racialized, this extends to racialized white people as well in terms of the detrimental impact of being racialized and racializing others. And there are plenty of people, not plenty, there should be more people <laughs> doing this type of research and analysis, but there are folks um, increasingly in my circle, like George Middleton, who's doing really profound work in, in social work and um, as it pertains to helping people de-racialize themselves, he calls it racial deconstruction, but that to me sounds too much along the lines of, of the language that reconstructionists have used for, for decades now, at least. Um, he calls it deconstruction, but I think de-racialization is a more apt thing to describe about the work that he's doing with all types of, of people from all different racializations. And similarly, Shayla Dubé, who I did a podcast with, I'll link that below as well. She's a social, a licensed social worker and she's doing similar work. Then there's Carlos Hoyt, a licensed social worker and psychotherapist who's doing similar work. And if you don't see the trend, <laughs> these people are, um, helping people in Canada and the U.S. grapple with the trauma of racism that gets passed on from generation to generation and has been disproven as an effective way to undo the harms or to stop the harms of racism. And something I'm learning more and more and more and more, and it just keeps getting affirmed for me, is when I talk about stopping racism in its tracks, people almost instantly presume I'm talking about the white versus black, instantly. And a lot of the questions then come through that filter. It comes through, how does this framework help a so-called black person? Because if I'm a black person, and I'm, I don't know, I'm out in, in some rural part and a KKK member comes and gets me. I can say I'm not black, but that KKK member, this is obviously an extreme example that somebody gave on Twitter recently, but that KKK member is not going to recognize me as not being black. They're going to see me as being black and they're going to do what they will with a so-called black person. So how does transcending race ideology or racism, how does disrupting that actually help so-called Black people? This is the kind of 
argument that I get. And that signals to me that people who are asking those kinds of questions really are still centering the thing called whiteness that they say that they want to disrupt, right? That they say that they are working to decenter. Why? Because when you understand the pernicious ways in which race ideology and racism actually operates on an individual level that gets magnified to be on a collective level, then you understand that anything a person can do in any discipline, in any field, in any industry, in any relationship to help racialize Black people grapple in a more generative way with both the history of racism and what racism is today in 2022. And anything that can be done to help racialized Black people liberate themselves from the tenuousness of race ideology that keeps them in the conundrum of always being traumatized and always passing the trauma on, even when we want to acknowledge the nuance and the complexity of that passing on, right? anything that can help racialized black people get outside of this things at this thing and liberate themselves from the framework from the fishbowl get into the ocean should be viewed as positive because what's not positive is anything about racialization there's nothing inherently that is inborn positive about being racialized as anything so to help anyone get outside of that thing while still acknowledging in a vastly more clear-eyed way the history and the now of racism, that's beneficial. Even if people want to argue that it's beneficial on only on an individual level, something to, of that nature. Because when enough individuals are given the keys to unlock themselves in ways that race ideology actually precludes, although it masquerades as all of these other things. So it seems vast. It seems like it's a wellspring of freedom. But when you know what racism is, you recognize that's not what's actually happening, right? As it pertains to the actual ideology of race, then the only answer if you ask a skeptical eliminativist like myself, the only answer is to get oneself outside of the fishbowl, period. And the more people that can get out of the fishbowl, first of all, this helps on an individual level. Yes, it helps people deal with in far more productive ways, the problem of racism, the history of it, the now of it, et cetera. How does it help? Well, it helps people, number one, stop internalizing all of the emotions that come along with the problem of racism, the pain, the anger, the angst, anxiety, the fear, all of that, the hatred, all of that. It frees a person from those feelings, which can be healthy in particular context, but in the context of racism is completely debunked as being a healthy manifestation of racism itself. So we've helped people free themselves from those emotions and we help people see themselves more clearly outside of the framework of race ideology, which means that the similarities that we have across racializations become more apparent and the differences that we have, even it, within intra-group racializations become, becomes more apparent. And in that way, we start to truly dismantle the framework or the architecture of racism, which created and maintains race ideology. And the more people who can do that, the more people who can be clear-eyed, astute, sometimes even um, when faced with explicit examples of racism can experience that racism in a way that doesn't 
harm the self. That is a positive thing for those people and as many people as can be given that toolkit. And at the same time, what's also happening that too many people seem to be missing is people who are racialized as white also engage with something like the theory of racistness. And even though many people who are racialized as white come in with some kind of misunderstanding of what's actually happening or what's being said, inevitably they end up learning something, right? If they hold their feet to the fire and stay a while and they too get the benefit of doing this deep and clear-eyed analysis of what racism is, what it isn't, what it's been historically, what it's been across time, what it is now, what it is in different places, all of that from a de-racialized perspective, which means that the feelings of guilt, shame, anger, fear, and hatred, that all of those feelings are um, not misplaced or misdirected. And in those ways, we have an opportunity to pass on to the next generation this framework that helps more people stop upholding racist ideas about human beings to, while at the same time, recognizing and acknowledging the existence of racism, while at the same time, stopping some of the harm that racism inflicts onto human society in its tracks. And that to me, is the ideal. That's how we get outside of this thing. We have to do better by ourselves, certainly, and we have to do better by our future generations. And that means that colorblindness, it ain't going to work because it didn't didn't work before. And people tell themselves a story that it did work for a few centuries. And then now all of a sudden we're going backwards. Well, that to me is is a signifier that it never worked. It didn't work. And it's not, it's not going to work. And it's not going to work because colorblindness still operates on the belief in race so that the detrimental impacts, only some of which I've barely scratched the surface in this conversation or monologue, I should say, uh, uh, those impacts still get passed on to people still get passed on to generation after generation, which is why in 2022, we're seeing so much division. And the division feels new, it feels regressive, but if you know the history of racism and you know the genealogy of race, you recognize that nothing has really changed. Nothing has really changed except for what people are bringing to the fore. And what people are bringing to the fore to the front that is it's all of these beliefs in race and all of these beliefs about how the only thing we can do with it is reconstruct it we have to reconstruct it first in order to eliminate it eliminate it is what some other people would say but why are we choosing a middleman type of of strategy or methodology when there are frameworks such as the theory of racistness that help people not have to skip any steps. We just go straight to the good stuff. We can go straight to freeing people from the strictures, analyzing and addressing and acknowledging the problem and facing it head on. And now let's put on our game faces and figure out how do we stop it moving forward? We stop it by not teaching our children to racialize themselves teaching them about racism from outside of the strictures of race, talking about how, historically speaking, the European colonizers and enslavers created the fiction of race in order to justify what was already on the ground, which was chattel slavery. And the language that comes with came with the racism was white, black, of color, etc. And over time, these different categorizations have been changed and, flu- and, and fluid. But in a lot of ways, nothing has changed. (laughs) Nothing has changed. And the one thing that has remained constant is the racism hiding its face in that category and through that language. And so how do we get outside of it? 
well, we look at this from a historical perspective from outside of the framework because we're forging a path forward in which all human beings are recognized as human beings that they want deserving and valuable of respect and admiration, kindness, love, all of the things, and absolutely undeserving of the dehumanization and the hate and the fear and the ignorance that comes along with race ideology. And if we can do that, and if we can stop racializing everything from the US census to a doctor's forms, which for literally no reason, they have you mark out what your race is and they conflate it with ethnicity. So you think it's one and the same. If those organizations like the NIH can stop upholding the belief in race as being something of nature or something that's real at all, or something that has to be real for any reason, then together we can truly overcome this thing. And I would do the same call of action for the media, the same call of action for the politicians, for NATO, for every organization that is profiting off of our continued division and our continued dividing ourselves amongst ourselves and our continued cloudiness as it pertains to the problems that affect negatively our societies. It's not going to be an easy path, but I would argue that reconstruction has also not been an easy path. It, this has come over centuries of reconstructive efforts and reconstruction has taken us as far as it can. It's taken us as far as it can. And the primary evidence you need of that is the fact that we've been doing it for centuries and you still have people feeling how they feel about, about race and racism. We don't have to continue to do this. And if enough individuals are given the toolkit, as I was saying earlier, if enough individuals are taught different philosophies of race, if enough, if enough people can understand that racelessness simply means when properly understood in the context of my work, simply means freedom from racism. That's it, that's all. Not freedom from different skin colors, not freedom from different cultures, not freedom from different ethnicities, nations, languages, foods, fashions, music, religions, mm -hmm. <laughs> you name it. It's not freedom from any of those things. The theory of racistness is speaking about the freedom from racism, period. And if we can understand that and stop locking up with whiteness and so-called white people, freedom from racism, which people have historically conflated racelessness with white people, and they've conflated freedom from racism with white people. We can continue to do that and reap what we sow. But if we're actually sincere about helping people here and now in real impactful ways, and if we're actually sincere about having any positive impact on any system that affects people, the education system, um, the prison system, <laughs> right, politics, any of that, then the best way forward is unlocking the freedom from racism that has been locked in and captured and conflated with racelessness across time because it's through those efforts that we can begin to have a, a, a true understanding of what the problem of racism is, what the material conditions actually are, because too many people, their heads are still in the clouds and they're presuming that certain narratives are correct and they're not. And I would argue that the only people who benefit from us continuously uh, not being clear-eyed about the problem both in how we talk about and how we address it would be the people at the upper echelons of the economic you know, hierarchy. But the rest of us, myself included, that person who's not in the upper echelons, we don't benefit from the ideology. We just don't. We don't benefit from the cloudiness. We don't benefit from the division. We don't benefit from any of it. So,
like Leonard, Leonard Harris says in one of his essays on necro being, I advocate for that reason and many, many more that are really too deep and too much to name in a single hour that we need to throw in the dustbins of forgotten history, the concept of race. We need to dismantle, deconstruct, whatever you wanna call it, our belief in race. And we need to do so with the express purpose of helping more people free themselves from the strictures of racism, from all of it. And if we can do that, the, the systems that people like to talk a lot about will follow suit and come in place because inevitably the fabric of society always reflects the beliefs of its citizens that's been true historically and it doesn't take but so many people to say no more are we going to do the thing that we've been doing for centuries from this day forward for change to truly come I was debating if I wanted to <laughs> look at the chat box and answer any questions, but truth be told, I think I'm going to leave it there. I will share some books this summer uh, because I'm always on a continuous journey to continue to develop my ideas and my theory to prove myself wrong. Uh, while I cannot be proven wrong about my skeptic <laughs> skeptical eliminativism, uh, which took me decades to actually get to, mind you, because uh, another aspect of this I think too many people miss is what I was talking about earlier, which is my own personal journey through all of the philosophies virtually. When I was younger, I was taught to be a naturalist, and I was undoubtedly a conservationist because I was a naturalist, and I experienced explicit racism too many times to recount. Uh, including being called the N-word, including my brother being shot at by a skinhead in the trailer park that I grew up in, including being called pubic hair and assaulted on a school bus when I was a middle schooler. Uh, you name it, I probably experienced it in, in a sort of interpersonal way, racism. And yet and still, I was definitely a naturalist and a conservationist. As I got to be an undergraduate, my philosophies shifted a little bit because I was an English major, but I specialized in African-American literature and as much as an undergraduate can specialize in, in anything within a major. Um, I did an advanced honors thesis on African-American literary studies. And it's because African-American literature has been consistently defined as always having to do with race and racism that I studied very intently race and racism, the production of race and the production even more specifically of blackness across time, starting as an undergraduate. And that resulted in something like a 88 page advanced honors thesis. I, I focused on Percival Everett's book, Erasure, and the research I had to do to properly complete that assignment was all about ideas of authenticity and representation, namely, as it pertained to Black people in the United States. And so I did that work. And then I took a lot of gap years because, um, it, let's see, at that time, I, I probably shifted from naturalism to constructionism. And even though I still believed as a constructionist that there was something biological about race, because I didn't know enough. Um, and I was undoubtedly a reconstructionist at that point. And after undergrad, I took some gap years and um, I worked. I worked in corporate America. I did teach for America. So I taught ninth to 12th graders in Houston at, a, at what was considered a last chance charter school. Um, it was a type of school where there are security bars all the way around and there's a security guard that's at the front. And when you come in, you get wandered down, shootings in the parking lot, just another school day. Um, that's, that's where I taught. And I taught English language arts and I got to 
really dig in even more with students into African-American literature, but then also just world literature. I, I was, I had a pretty broad reach in terms of what I taught in my classes. And then I did my master's degree around the same time that I was in TFA. And through my studies at the University of Houston, I worked with Lawrence Hoag, um, who's known in African-American literary circles. Um, and I learned even more about race and racism as it pertained to uh, African-Americans and American society more broadly speaking. And I was still a reconstructionist constructionist. Fast forward some more years, I lived in something like five other states I ended in San Francisco in that area. I worked in San Jose and I was a general manager for 24 hour fitness. I had a team of something like hundred employees. And um, I was about that fitness life. If you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen some of my bodybuilding photos from my bodybuilding days, which wasn't that long ago, but um, it feels long enough ago. And all during that time, I'm still being a social scientist in a lot of ways because I'm still learning, I'm still reading, I'm still doing conferences, I'm still getting published. So even though I wasn't officially in school, I was keeping myself in school. Um, and then I started my PhD at Howard University in 2016 and still a constructionist, reconstructionist, shifted to a constructionist, eliminativist, probably within a year of, of resuming my studies. And um, that was a hard shift for me, the eliminativist part, because although I recognized through my decades then of researching and observing and thinking and writing and all of the things, although I recognized the problems pretty clearly, and although I recognize the solutions that were being presented to me through my historical and literary analysis, namely that to undo racism, we had to undo race. That's how I articulated it at that time. I didn't want to accept it because I had an emotional attachment to what I perceived to be my race, what I considered to be my blackness. I felt I felt all the feels. I felt enamored by it. This is this is one of the pain points for me when I see so many people misunderstanding what's happening for a lot of racialized Black people, though certainly not all, when it comes to this victim narrative. I loved my Blackness. I did not see myself as a victim. And I also, I didn't see myself as a victim per se of any of the hardships and the traumas that I've been through from extensive and persistent homelessness to child abuse to domestic violence as an adult to being drugged and raped. I never, I never saw myself as just neatly only a victim of something. I felt I was a victim of circumstances, certainly, but my, by acknowledging my victimhood in particular instances where I was undoubtedly a victim, including the examples of racism I gave a few minutes ago, it never precluded me from seeing who I was in all of my complexities or seeing other people in their complexities. It never precluded me from loving myself, from seeing my self-worth, um, and for always striving to be the best version of myself that I could possibly be for myself. And because that's how I was seeing myself and because that's how I was experiencing what I consider to be my blackness, I put everything positive into that um, categorization everything positive, everything I loved about myself, I put it in there. And that's how you end up with, with, with many people saying unabashedly, Black lives matter. I am Black and proud, right? I'm Blackity Black. I have to do two things, stay Black and die. That's why you have people saying those kinds of sentiments unabashedly, because there's a certain amount of love 
there's a certain amount of empathy and compassion that's built into how people perceive their blackness, as well as the fact that culture gets wrapped up and conflated with that too. And most people tend to love and have affinity for their culture. So I went through all of that. And I was in my mentor's office on more than one occasion crying about what my brain was showing me um, and the conclusions that I was coming to uh, because I didn't want to not see myself as black, period. Even though I saw the problem so clearly, I didn't want to let go of it. It wasn't something that I wanted to eliminate, eradicate, put to the side or throw in the dustbin. And I remember my mentor, she told me each time very lovingly that I didn't have to be the martyr. I didn't have to be the person today who decided to not call myself black or whatever, but that I did have an obligation to continue to do my research, to continue to share, publish, go to conferences, talk about my ideas, et cetera, and not be quiet about it, but that it would essentially would be the next generation's job to engage with my scholarship and do with it what, what they might. And I was dissatisfied with that. I was dissatisfied with, with that answer because as much as I know this is a long game, right? This isn't, I do not believe, Sheena Mason does not believe as much as it might sound to people within um, range of my voice, I don't believe that tomorrow the problem is going to be fixed, right? 100%. I don't believe that. Might be fixed for 10 more people, but it's not going to be fixed, right? Our, the nation's belief system, which is arguably the primary system that needs attention and focus, because the belief system, the education system, the knowledge system, those systems are entangled and enmeshed and infiltrate and affect every other system a person could point to when they talk about racism or anything else for that matter. We need to do that. We need to tend to that. And I did, I, I, <laughs> I knew that I couldn't change it now or tomorrow necessarily. And I have hope that our next generations can do good work in forging better futures for everyone and not just the upper echelons of the economic society or, or social classes for that matter. But because I know what I know, I also didn't wanna be a hypocrite and I didn't wanna be upholding the same thing I was saying other people were unintentionally upholding. And I didn't want to just accept the fact that people were going to engage with me or engage with my ideas and tell me about my ideas or what I should think because they see me as a racialized black woman and as a racialized black woman and because racism works in the ways that it does, I'm supposed to think a certain thing. I'm supposed to think a certain way. I'm supposed to stay in the box and stay in my lane and stay in my place and all of the things. And people across both sides of the spectrum fall into this horrible trap of thinking that because I'm racialized in a particular way, I have to just roll over and take it. I just have to accept it. I can't think outside of the bounds of Anthony Appiah's skepticism or eliminativism. I can't be bold enough like Nelson Mandela was or, or, or Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi or any true mover and shaker in the, in the world, historically speaking. I can't be bold enough to think outside of what people have already thought because I'm black, I have to just agree with the reconstructionist constructionist position full stop, according to these people. And because I don't agree, and because I actually contend that we're doing it wrong, we're doing this thing called anti-racism wrong and actually upholding the problem, now I'm the problem. That, my friends, is, is just part of how racism works. It'd be, it be having people so comfortable and confident in telling me what I should think and how I should think and what I should imagine for the future of my children and your children and my grandchildren, our grandchildren, 
that uh, I'm supposed to just put my knowledge and put my methodology, which is increasingly tried and true, to the side and just go along with what we've been doing already for centuries to no effect, largely. Well, fortunately, I didn't resist my own ideas in the ways that I was initially um, inspired and, and in some ways encouraged to. Fortunately, I did what my advisor said. I kept researching, you know, I kept, I held my feet to the fire in the same ways that I'm inviting you to hold your feet to the fire. And I kept at it. I kept exploring. I kept thinking. A quality some people would do well to um, exhibit more often is thinking deeply about something before drawing conclusions necessarily um, or speaking loudly about their conclusions, I will say. And in doing that, I also was introduced to Jacoby Carter, who I mentioned earlier, who is a philosopher at Howard University, and he was on my dissertation committee. And he taught me philosophies of race, as in he taught me the language of it. He taught me the scholars, right? He taught me um, and opened up a world of possibility to me that I hadn't yet been privy to, even in all of my study and research of race and racism. And it was at that time where he told me, the first conversation I had with him, he said, Sheena, you're not crazy. <laughs> I think I needed to hear it at that point. He said, you're not crazy. He's like, I'm a constru constructionist eliminativist. This is him speaking. And you're not alone. You're not crazy. And you're not a white supremacist or a racist or whatever other kind of, um, you know, ways that people can try to diminish what you're saying without engaging with the content of what you're saying. And I remember, um, I remember how I felt in that moment, which was just affirmed, if nothing else, I felt affirmed, I felt, and I felt like, truly, I wasn't alone. And the door was open to me in ways that otherwise it felt a little stifled. <laughs> um, and it was through my engagement of the proper philosophies of race, whereas before I was, I was reading philosophies of race through the history and the literature without knowing it, without having a language for it. Um, once I engaged with the actual uh, scholarship from the discipline, oh, I, I was unstoppable. And then a couple of years later, right before I defended my dissertation, I recognized that I was switching from being a constructionist to a skeptic. And the switch for me was recognizing that everything I put into the category of my blackness, none of it was racial, none of it. Not my skin color, not my hair texture, not my nose, not my tenacity, not my self-determination, um, not my intellect, not my kindness, my love, compassion, affinity for human beings, <laughs> none of it, N not my love for rap music, <laughs> right? All of the ways in which we could essentialize uh, what it is to be Black, none of it was racial. And that culture creates the fiction of race, not the other way around. That is race doesn't create culture. So race doesn't determine or dictate culture because if that were true, then there would be a handful of cultures and not the plethora of cultures that we actually have, right? Um, that skin color, it, while seen as a proxy for race is not actually race, same as hair texture, you name it. All the way down the line, I came, it was like something opened up in my mind and everything I presumed was racial and packaged with my blackness, I recognize, oh, <laughs> oh, it's not actually race. It's not anything to do with race. It's not racial. It's all these other things. It's how I show up culturally. It's how I show up um, 
in, in spaces as Sheena in terms of how my characteristics are, right? Which again, doesn't, it's not determined by my race, by my racialization, no matter how you look at it, none of that is determined by any of that. And I switched from skepticism to eliminativism. And that was within the, that was, that switch was within the last couple of years. So it has been a long journey to where I am. And hear me when I say I've thought deeply about every aspect of what I'm talking about that, that should be clear to most people live, listening to my voice or reading any of my work. Um, and it's because I know everything I know that I come down on the side that I come down in terms of skepticism and eliminativism. And skepticism does open more doors to more people in terms of having generative dialogue about the problem of racism historically and now generative as in some of the barriers that might otherwise exist because of how we tend to do things uh, don't exist because we're operating from a different framework. We're operating outside of the fishbowl. Um, and that is all day, every day, something positive. Additionally, Another benefit of operating from this other framework and from engaging with my particular philosophies of race would include the fact that if racism isn't what many people are taught, I would argue programmed even to think it is, then to know what it is really and to, and to know its impact, it has some positive um positive outcomes from that journey so the example i gave in my last podcast which i'll just restate was something to the effect of in one of my classes i'm a uh, an assistant professor in one of my classes spontaneously we just started researching some different numbers and statistics to get our heads around this question of like what is racism systemic, number one? If it is or if it isn't, how does it manifest itself today that we can prove um, quantitatively and qualitatively? And so I just started researching some numbers and my students and I were kind of, you know, jaws on the ground. Um, and I think the reason why I went down the law enforcement path was because so many of my students would bring it up. And up until that point of the semester, I hadn't challenged their ideas about that in a way that uh, stuck with them. Because I think the ways that I challenged it, I think some of them kind of missed because then they would keep bringing it up. It was like their best example of, of evidence of racism. Uh, systemic racism, I should say, and the fear that they felt I should have as a so-called Black person and so on and so forth. And so we just started looking up the numbers and we were all kind of floored. And I remember a lot of my students expressed to me the discomfort in realizing how wrong they were as it pertained to that particular aspect of what they thought was racism or just like a blatant example of what racism was. And they were experiencing the feelings of what it can feel like to be wrong, to be really um, convicted in your beliefs and what you know to be true, but really it's what you believe to be true and to find out that you've been wrong. But then it was also my students expressing a sigh of relief in a lot of ways, a sigh of oh, the problem isn't actually what I thought it was. And actually, that's a happy finding, right? And if you can help people get to those happy findings, if you will, um, more efficiently and effectively, it strikes me that that also is a very positive thing. Because, again, if, if certain ideas about how racism operates in the world are false, that is not rooted in actual reality, but 
are rooted in people's realities, which I, are, are, are sometimes two different things, right? Now I'm really sounding like a philosopher. <laughs> uh, to, to help more people come to capital R reality, that's actually a positive thing because then we can stop focusing on the wrong things in some ways. Then we can focus on uh, where there are more pervasive or persistent problems or examples of systemic racism, which again, I would say number one of those examples would be our belief system, which I, I see as being along the same lines of our knowledge system, which are on the same lines of our education system. So if we can unlock those keys, that's probably where we should start. And um, this category of whiteness, Dr. Carter, one of my mentors would say, probably that should go first <laughs> as it pertains to race ideology. Um, and I would, I would concede that point. I say, let's throw it all out the window at the same time. But there's also this misinterpretation of of my work as having to do with um, taking something away from so-called black people, for example. But when properly understood, you recognize I'm not taking anything away from racialized black people except the violence of racism, which should be viewed as a very good thing by people who aren't racist. And especially those who count themselves as anti-racist. Um, so, Hopefully this was illuminating in some ways to those of you who are who are kind enough to join me. And if you have any questions that didn't get answered, I encourage you to go to the actual video after the live and comment. Number one, you help assist this algorithm out. Uh, <laughs> I want more people to see this video. So do that. Go comment if you have a question or if you have a comment, whatever it is. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. If you're just following, even if you're following just to troll, just to spy, <laughs> go ahead and subscribe since you're already, you're, you're here and you, you don't want to miss out on what I'm going to say next. So subscribe and um, I'll see y'all very soon. I'm going to do some more solo podcasts because if it's not clear, I have a lot to share and a lot to get off of my mind. So between writing my second book, which I'm writing with um, a speed and veracity that is known to, to be true to who and how I am, um, I'm going to also supplement some of the material that I'm going to put in that second book with some conversations. So the next topic of conversation will be how I view ethnicity and culture. And by extension, how I view the word American, um, especially because in this conversation slash monologue, I was talking about how racializing culture and racializing ethnicity maintains the problem. So by extension, then using race language and a, language associated with race and thereby racism actually unintentionally upholds the same thing many of us would would do well to do away with. So I'm not just pointing out the problem without having some kind of solution. So I'm going to come back next week or tomorrow <laughs> um, with what I think part of that solution is for those of us in the United States. Until next time,